All right, there we go. So uh, this is our, I think, our fourth week. Uh, we're doing this pastor's Bible study. And um, tonight what I want to do is I want to um, finish up the preliminary lessons. And um, we started, of course, you remember, we started talking about what is the Bible in the last several weeks. We've been talking about how to study the Bible, and I want to finish that up tonight. Um, and then it'll be a little bit of a shorter lesson because after that, then I want to um, spend some time talking about what we do next. And part of what we'll have to talk about uh, with respect to what we do next is what night of the week uh, we're going to have this study on. Um, because I, I messed up when Kate and I were talking about the ladies' Bible study that will start back up in September. And she had asked me about Tuesday nights if there was anything at the church that it would conflict with. And my brain was saying, no, there's nothing at the church. But it didn't register that Tuesday night was the night we did this. So we'll have to talk about what we do in September. She's already kind of put that out to the ladies that the ladies' Bible study will start on September on Tuesday nights in September. So we'll talk at the end what we're going to do and what study we're going to do next, where we'll go from here. So let me open up our time in a word of prayer, and then we'll finish up these preliminary lessons, um, and then we'll spend some time talking about what comes next. So join me in a word of prayer. And Father, thank you once again uh, that we have the opportunity to gather together this over this technology. This is amazing. Um, and Lord, I just pray that you would just bless this time and teach us and guide us. And Lord, we, we can always count on your Holy Spirit to teach us and guide us into all truth and to help us to understand your word. And so, Lord, as we open it up tonight and we spend some time talking about applying some of these principles we've been talking about, Lord, I just pray that you would just bless our time. And Lord, those that are joining us via Zoom and those that uh, are joining via YouTube, Father, I just pray that this would just be a time where, where we're challenged and we grow in our skills and our relationship. We're better equipped to serve you, better equipped to follow you. Would you bless our time tonight? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, we started a couple of weeks ago with that first preliminary lesson talking about what is the Bible. And we used some words, words that you hear a lot of times talking about doctrinal positions of church or whatever. Um, and the words are inspired, infallible, inerrant. And those are the words that we use to describe the Bible. We looked um, there in 2 Timothy 3.16 and we saw those words really come from that passage. And so when we talked about those words, infallible, inspired, inerrant, what does that mean? Do you remember when we, that lesson a few weeks ago, what we talked about? What do those words tell us about the Bible? Inspired, inherent. What was the thing? My yeah. brain just left it. Inspired, <clears throat> inerrant, infallible. Oh, that. That it's written by, uh, well, I, I guess more inspired by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And you remember we saw that word there in that passage in 2 Timothy 3 that um, specifically that it uses that word that the Bible is God breathed, and that's the way that it, the NIV translates it. That it really comes, it really is the heart and the breath, um, and, and comes from God himself. This is, this is his word, and that's what those words mean. And then really because of that, then it reflects all of his character. And, and so why is that significant, that we, that we talk about that, that we even start with that? What's significant about thinking about those things about the Bible? What well, lends to their strength, the power that's behind them, uh, the, that it's... Uh, trustworthy um yeah exactly Ruben. exactly and it, it talks about the authority of the bible if this is the actual word of god himself then it has authority inherent authority and because it is his word 
it reflects his character. Absolutely trustworthy. So you're absolutely right. It, it reflects his authority, reflects his trustworthiness. The implications of that, that our actions, our attitudes, um, our thought life, society as a whole bows to the word of God because of the authority. It, the, the word of God doesn't bow to society. I remember several years ago, I was TDY to Keesler down there to Biloxi. And I was attending a church in D'Iberville. I don't think the church is there anymore, Brody Road Baptist Church. I was attending that church. And I didn't know it at the time. I would go on to serve as an interim pastor at that church at one point in time, but I didn't know that. This is the first time I'd been there. And the pastor stood in the pulpit. Um, I don't have the guts to do this. This was a powerful illustration. It's stuck with me now for some 20 years, but I don't have the guts to do it. And he opened up a Bible. It wasn't his preaching Bible. He opened up a Bible, and he started flipping the pages, and he said, you know, here in the Ten Commandments, it, it talks about thou shalt, not, uh, thou shalt not lie. And, you know, I find that hard to do, and I don't really like that. So he tore the page out he crumpled it up and threw it on the floor. And then he started flipping some pages some more, and he gets over the New Testament. He said, you know, Jesus said, if you look at a woman lustfully, then you've committed adultery in your heart. And, you know, that really makes me uncomfortable, and I don't like that. So he tore the page out. He crumpled it up and he threw it on the floor. And he did that with three or four things. I don't remember everything he did it with, but he did it with three or four things. And his his point was that when we start to pick and choose stuff in Scripture, start to say that I will decide what of the Bible has authority in my life and what does not. Now that's essentially what we're doing. We're just tearing pages out and say, I have I have the authority to decide what will stay in here. But we recognize it is God's word. This is his very word to us. We don't have that authority. It, it has inherent authority over our lives, our actions, and all of society bows down to the Bible. The Bible does not bow down to society. And in society now, there are some, some times when uh, even in some church communities where they, they try to reinterpret Scripture based on societal beliefs and norms. What are some examples of that happening right now in society? Um, well, just, I know for recently when we were, before we left, there was a concern. Uh, there was a non-denominational church that was uh, basically baptizing uh, known uh, homosexual husbands and, and mm. it was, like married, yeah, lesbian married. couples. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, and that's, that certainly is one of the issues, right, um, in our society now, that um, there are some who would say, because society is now accepting the issue of homosexuality in particular, because society is accepting that issue, then we really ought to take a, a second look at what the Bible says. We ought to see those passages that, that, where in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 6, for example, where, where Paul talks about that in, in a list of a whole other sins, we really ought to see that differently um, and not, not call it out as a sin per se anymore because society recognizes it. I see it also happening sometimes in, in parenting styles. Uh, you know, as, as parenting styles have evolved over time and there's a, a billion parenting experts out there telling parents how they ought to raise their kids and and don't discipline them and just let them be and do whatever they want and certainly don't ever spank. And so the parents begin to look at some of the wisdom in Proverbs, for example, about train up a child in the way he should go. And the fact that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, a rod of discipline will drive it far from him. And so start to reinterpret that and say, well, that, you know, we, we don't really need to pay attention to that because society has moved on and evolved. But when we recognize the inherent authority of God's word, we say, regardless of how society has moved along, God's word still is authoritative in our lives. Now, it may, we may apply some things, how we parent our children, for example. We may apply some of those things a little differently. But at the same time, we, we can't discount and throw out the authority of the Bible just because society has moved on. 
And so we started with that. I think that's a critical, a critical foundational truth because with that, then we must know how to study the Bible correctly. And so then we talked last week and then we'll finish our wrap up and then move on to what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, we talked about some of the principles you remember for Bible study. Uh, when we approach the word of God, when we're going to study it. And I would say it, without reteaching that lesson, if there is one principle that you got to hold on to, it's context, context, context. Make sure you keep it in context. Don't pull it out and, and, and misread, misread uh, portions of scripture because we, we are reading them literally when they're poetic language and we're ignoring the historical context and all of those things. Make sure you keep scripture in context. And then we talked last week, particularly we focused in on the new testament letters you know we talked a little about a little bit about some of the genres and kind of what how they impact our our interpretation of them to understand narratives the law texts for example in the old testament they're pretty straightforward you just kind of read them as they are psalms is very poetic so you can't just take everything absolutely literally in psalms because a lot of poetic language there so we talked about genres and how they affect study. And then we focused in on the New Testament letters. What were, what were a few of the principles of the New Testament letters that we talked about? Do you remember some of them? What do you, like, what do you mean? Well, we talked about how to approach New Testament letters. Right. Um, what are some principles, uh, particularly with, with that genre, what are some principles to study the New Testament letters really help us understand what is going oh. on? Sort of <clears throat> Sorry. Um, yeah. As far as like uh, who the audience was and who, where it was coming from and their, their purpose. In other words, uh, the, the example that I liked that you gave was it was a, well, it was a phone call that we couldn't hear the other end. Uh, or, or the reason for even the reason for the phone call. We don't know. We know something was up, but we don't know the details as to why they were even writing the letter or Paul was, for example. Yeah, exactly, Ruben. And, and that's, that's important to remember. And we focused in on the New Testament letters or, or letters in general, um, because a, a significant portion of the New Testament is letters. And so, it, it, it's important that we understand what we're doing with them because there is so much of it in that format. And yeah, when we come to reading the letters, there's a reason that they were written, a problem, a question, an issue, something. And, and yeah, that analogy that I used last week is that it's kind of like we're listening to only half of a phone conversation. We really have to try to do a little detective work, fill in the blanks, so to speak, and try to, from what they what the author says, how they give an answer, for example, we've got to figure out what, what was the question? What is it that was going on? The things they address, what was the problem? What would cause them to say that? Um, the other thing we talked about was, like you would do with any other letter, read the whole thing at first. It, and usually they're, they're not very long, so it doesn't take very long, but read the entire thing. Because then you kind of you can start to ask some of those questions of the text. Who wrote it? Who did they write it to? What seemed to be going on? What are some of the major themes that are happening here? So you really get a good sense of what what is what is the the background here? What is going on? So when I read the things in the letter and I focus in on one passage, I know how it fits into the whole. Um, okay, so. That kind of maybe a really quick review of what we have done up to this point. Now, what I want to do tonight, two things. Um, well, maybe two things. Uh, for sure, I want to do an application exercise. I want us to open a book of the Bible, particularly Colossians. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and turn to the book of Colossians. Um, and I want us to apply some of these principles that we've been talking about, about how to study the New Testament letters. And we're going we're gonna to look at some passages and I'm going to ask you some questions and, and together we're going to kind of answer some of these key questions about the text. Who wrote it? 
Uh, to whom was it written? What was going on? What do we learn from what is written? Because remember, I, I want this time to not just be about me giving you a fish. I want to teach you how to fish. Um, I, I don't, I want to give you the skills and equip you so that you're not always dependent on someone to teach you how to pull these golden pearls of wisdom out of uh, out of scripture, but you can do that yourself. You can begin to do that and, and really flesh out and enrich your own study life. So we're going to do a little extra application exercise. And if we have time, we'll spend a few minutes and talk about the different Bible translations. I said, I think last week that I was just going to send that out to you, but I thought if we have time tonight, we'll spend a few minutes talking about that. Um, and then I do want to spend the last several minutes mapping out our way forward, figuring out where we're going to go from here. Okay. So open up your Bible to Colossians. I just open up to chapter one and we'll be kind of moving through some of the different um, places in it uh, to take a look at what is going on and i want us to apply some of these skills now of course if you were going to study colossians um, the first thing i would tell you is of course read it read the whole thing it's not a long letter um i think i may have mentioned this last time when i was preparing to preach through colossians one time and, and i was talking about this and encouraging the congregation to read through it i timed myself and I turned on the stopwatch on my phone and I started reading and I just timed myself. And, and I'm a slow reader. I'm a plotter when it comes to reading. It took me, I think, nine minutes to read the whole letter. So it's not long, uh, four short chapters. So if you were going to study it, I would say first read it, read the whole thing through. And what I do when I prepare to study a passage is I'll, I'll do that. And I get a spiral notebook, just a pen and paper and i start answering questions based on the text who wrote it where do i find that who was the audience where do i find that uh, what was going on and where do i find that so i i spend some time and i i make those notes so that's what we're going to do tonight you can take notes if you want write this stuff down if you want um or you can um just kind of just kind of Remember the lesson so that when you get to the point where I'm going to ask you if you want to lead a study, um, you, these lessons will have stuck and uh, there'll be something that, that you can apply on your own. My screen, the video on my screen has gotten all messed up here, so I'm, I'm not sure what I'm doing to the recording playing with the video, but hopefully it's, it works out okay. Okay, so um, go ahead and take your uh, your mute off because I'm going to be asking you some questions here. Okay, so as we look at um, the lesson, first of all, or look at the book of Colossians, rather, first of all, who wrote it? Looking there at chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, that's where we'll find it. Who wrote the letter? I'm not. I'm answering for the team because we have Roman who wants to answer all the questions. So Paul, Paul starts yeah. off as the writer. Yeah, Paul, and, and he just identifies himself up front. And, you know, that's, that's in, in letters, the way we write them, we identify ourselves at the end, right? We'll say, love Barry, your friend Barry. We'll, we'll, we'll put our name at the end. Um, and in fact, we put the address, who we're writing to, is at the beginning of the very first thing we say, and then we put our name at the end. Not the first century letters, they identified the writer, usually the author right up front. And so Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, he says, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So the two of them were together, uh, apparently, when they wrote this letter. So Paul's the author. To whom is he writing? Because one thing we can figure out who's writing the letter, that's important for us to know. And who's the audience? He keeps going there into verse two. Who's the audience he's writing to? So the <clears throat> uh, saints and faithful at Colossae. So those uh, fellow believers in this area. Okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, and that's important. It's good that you, that you picked that out, Ruben. We, it's, in, it's important to notice that 
he's writing to people in Colossae. Obviously, that's how the letter gets the title, um, the letter of Paul to the Colossians. Now, you remember, or, and maybe I mentioned this, if I didn't, I'll mention it now. Um, the title, the chapter marks, the verse numbers, those were not part of the original. So when he when he wrote it, he just wrote the letter. He didn't put all those all those numbers. He didn't title it that way. This is my letter to the Colossians. But we get a sense these either it was written to the church at Colossae. And Reuben, you notice something significant. He really he tells us something about the audience. We we understand they're believers. He called them saints. He called them faithful brethren. And sometimes that's super important to know that. That really does shape sometimes how we, excuse me, how we understand some of the things that are said later on in the letter. And I think, for example, maybe the the chief example of kind of the most misused one, I think, is over in James chapter two. James chapter two, verse 17. James says, faith, if it has no works, is dead. And, you know, the, the Mormon church, for example, has, has built this belief system based on that statement, this faith plus works salvation teaching. And they've built an entire doctrine around this idea, just that one statement where James says, Faith by itself without works is dead. That faith cannot save you. That's what he says. But it, but again, it's important to know who is being written to. In that case, in the case of James, um, he says right up front in James chapter 1, verse 2, consider it all joy, my brethren. James, like Paul, is writing to believers. He's not telling them how to be saved. He's telling them the the consequences of, the implications of their salvation. And so it's important to know who the audience is because that helps us avoid some of those misunderstandings, those misinterpretations. Okay, so Paul wrote it. Timothy may may have co-written it, wrote it to believers who were at a city called Colossae. And if you were studying this letter, I would say open up a a Bible encyclopedia or a Bible dictionary or a good commentary and learn a little bit about the city of Colossae. Kind of give you some of the historical, cultural, social stuff that was going on that really kind of helped shape what is happening. Okay, what is the relationship between Paul and the audience? What's the relationship there? What's the attitude that he has towards his audience? Um, can, can one of you read verses 3 through 8 of chapter 1? Yeah, I don't know. Colossians 3? No. Colossians 1, um, one. verses 3 through 8. Oh, yeah. Oh, Sorry, I'm just coming in. That's right. Uh, it says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord in Christ Jesus, and of the love you have for all the saints, because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. We have already heard about this hope in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. It is bearing fruit and growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly sorry, appreciate God's I had God's my notes on the keyboard, and somehow everything went dead all of a sudden. Are y'all still there? Yeah. Can you see us? Okay, I see your face. I did for a second. Can y'all still hear me? Yeah. Can Can you hear Roman? I can't hear you anymore, so it is. Okay. All right. Michael and Natasha, welcome. I didn't see you guys pop up, so I'm glad you guys are here. Um, yeah, okay, so you guys can still hear me, but for some reason I can't hear you anymore, and I'm not sure what has just happened. Um, 
turn my volume up. Maybe that's it. Okay. Um, so, so we look at verses three through eight, and and the question we're asking is, what's the relationship between the author and the audience? What do you get out of that passage? What's the relationship between the? What's the attitude that Paul has toward this audience, this group of believers in Colossae? What do you see there? We were, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Well, we were, we we're pausing to give, uh, to share some airtime. That's, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Amanda was saying that definitely fellow believers. Yeah. And it seems positive. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a very sort of, warm right uh very encouraging kind of attitude um you know he talks about the you know we heard of your faith in jesus christ the love you have for all the saints we're, we're praying always for you right it's this very sort of very warm friendly attitude that paul has toward these believers i mean you know just just as a sort of a a contrast to that if you were to look in Galatians chapter one and ask the same question, what is Paul's attitude toward the churches in Galatia when he wrote to them? And if you flip back there to Galatians chapter one, verse six, he says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of God for a different gospel. It's not really another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And so, wow, that sounds very different, right? And that's, that's very much a parent giving a lecture to a wayward child in, in Galatians. So you, so you can get a sense a little bit of the, the, the attitude between Paul and the church. Here in Colossae, it's a very warm, a very friendly, a very encouraging kind of relationship or attitude anyway. What's the relationship between the two? What do you think should we what do you think we make out of the fact that um he says in verse four, since we have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ? What do you think that's telling us? So I I actually was gonna jump to seven and eight, but yeah, I guess it, it's also mentioned in four. <laughs> But that I didn't catch it from the herd part, but in seven and eight, it it to me is means that he they don't know them personally, mm -hmm. that they know them through Epaphras. Yeah. Uh, that basically he's put in a good word for that area that they're they've uh, converted and now he's uh, encouraging them. Yeah, that's a great insight. Yeah, and that's exactly it. Um, Paul's got some very warm feelings and a very good, positive, encouraging attitude toward this church. But by and large, these are strangers. And these are people that, that we get the, the sense that he has never met. Um, so, you know, he, he may have never been to Colossae. He didn't, he didn't plant this church. He says down in verse 7, and you caught it, Ruben. He said down in verse 7, you learned this from Epaphras. Very likely, he was the one who planted the church. And he had reported these things to Paul. And we find out later that Epaphras is with Paul when he writes this letter. So Epaphras has reported these things about the church in Colossae. But yeah, so we again, we're reading the text and saying, what do we learn here about the author, his attitude towards them, and even this idea that he's never met this church. These very much are strangers to him, although he knows some things about them. Okay, where is Paul? When he writes this letter now he doesn't tell us there up front uh, turn over to chapter 4 verse 3 in chapter 4 where is paul when he writes this letter
Go ahead. He's in prison. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and so to get to get a sense of what's you know what's in Paul's head, what kind of circumstances, what situation is he in when he's writing this, and I and I think that makes many of the things that he says in these prison epistles. There are four letters that that it's believed he that he wrote during these this same imprisonment: Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And they're usually lumped together when you study them in the prison epistles. And it makes it more remarkable, I think, when, when you read the letter and, you know, think about if you were writing a letter to a friend and you were in prison, what would your letter be about? You know, you might talk about the terrible conditions in prison or how much I miss my family or how much I want to get out of here or how, you know, you might talk about some of those things. Send, send me stuff. Give me yeah. stuff. I need cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know, send me things. Write to me. Send me, you know, let, send me some encouragement. Send me some things. Send me some stuff. But, but I dare say that probably most of us, if we wrote a letter from prison, our letter would be a lot about us and the circumstance we're in, the situation we're in. But you read these letters that Paul wrote from prison and you say, his letters are not about him. His letters are all about them, all about encouraging them, in this case, encouraging their faith. And, and you read Philippians, for example, and you realize he was in prison when he writes this letter with such a, a tremendous theme about joy. And so when you, when you realize where he was, you say, wow, that makes what he said that much more remarkable. So yes, Paul's in prison. The book of Acts ends, Acts chapter 28, ends with Paul in prison. Uh, he's in prison for two years uh, at the end of the book of Acts, and many scholars believe that's when he wrote these four letters, at the end of the book of Acts. That would have been somewhere around early 60 AD. That won't be on the test later, but that'll be somewhere around early 60s AD. Okay, why? See, this is the key question. Why did he write the letter? Now, I think the temptation at this point for us, if we're studying the letter, is to pull out somebody's commentary, right? And let me flip through it and let me figure out what somebody smart and better educated than me had to say. But the text tells us why he wrote the letter. Remember, we're listening to what half of a phone conversation. And so let me pull out a few passages and I want you to read them and then tell me what are some things that might've been going on as far as why he would have written this letter. Okay, chapter two, verses five through eight. Sorry, but let me get you guys in this conversation. Can one of you read that for us? Colossians 2, verses 5 through 8. Um, for though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Okay, so then what's one of the reasons Paul wrote this letter? What was going on there in Colossae, do you think, from that passage that would have caused Paul to, to make those kinds of comments? Well, to me, it sounds like uh, he's heard uh, word or caught wind that, you know, people are trying to deceive the church and give, you know, he says it in uh, verse eight, deceptive philosophy to kind of steer them in the wrong direction and not where they need to be. Exactly right, Michael. And there, there's this idea, these kind of worldly philosophies. Now, it's a little frustrating for us, right? Because he doesn't tell us what they, he doesn't say what they are. But he didn't need to. They knew what they were. And so just his, him saying those, those phrases, talking about the, the philosophy and empty deceit and the traditions of men, they knew exactly what he was talking about. Now, we don't know that entirely, what, what he was talking about. But we do know that was an issue. There were some philosophies that were being taught in the church that were contrary 
to good, sound biblical doctrine. So he was dealing with this. Why he would have said that. Okay, turn over to chapter 3. Um, and let's look at verses 8 through 11 of chapter 3. And somebody read those for us. Colossians 3, 8 through 11. And go. But now put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of your creator. In Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Okay, so what do you think was going on in the church that, I mean, it's almost, almost straightforward, but what do you think was going on in the church that would have caused Paul to say those kinds of things? Uh, so my first thought on these is that uh, he's kind of breaking down the barriers or walls that come with like uh, background, history, uh, religion, or where you're from. So in other words, it doesn't matter anymore if you're Greek or Jew or if you've been circumcised or not. It, it kind of, you're all the same under, under Christ. Well, it sounds like they were fighting with each other. Yeah. Like they were, you know, like it says here, they were mad at each other. They were uh, using bad words. They were lying to each other. You Slander. Know? Yeah, they were at each other's throats. Yeah, exactly right. And and I think I think all of those things that that's you know, sort of the, the the simple answer there, right? That's why he would write all that stuff because they're doing all that stuff. They're lying to one another apparently. They're using abusive speech, and they're, they're slandering one another. They're angry, and they're taking out their wrath on each other. Right? They must have been doing that kind of stuff, or he wouldn't have said, don't do that anymore. And then, yeah, there's some sort of disunity, just bringing disunity in the church. And so, they, yeah, it comes back in verse 11, and he said, listen, in this renewal, there's no distinction here. There's no reason to kind of separate into camps and say, well, I'm, I'm a Greek and you're a Jew. I'm circumcised and you're uncircumcised. No, no reason to do that in Christ. We're all one. And so, yeah, so as you start to read the text, as you're reading through the letters, look for these kind of clues. Ask those questions always when you come to these, you know, certain passages. Ask, your, ask yourself the question, why would he say that? What, what must have been happening there, or what question would they have asked maybe that would have driven that kind of answer, or what set of circumstances would have driven that kind of answer? And so we think of, we, so when we see those things, we look at these passages, and we start to ask some of the questions, we get some of the major themes of the letter, right? He's encouraging them to be grounded in God's Word. Rather than just sort of being, you know, chasing whatever is the main philosophy of the day, to be firmly grounded in God's word. Um, he's encouraging them to live like creatures in Christ, like new creatures in Christ, to live out their faith. He's encouraging them to do that. The first part of chapter three, set your mind on things above, not things that are on the earth. He's encouraging them to have a kingdom focus, really to see when Christ saved you. How does, how does that impact the world around you? We're changed now. We're different. Same thing we were talking about on Sunday. We, we've got a, a new set of priorities now. So he's encouraging them to do that. And then, and then later on down there in chapter 3 and on to chapter 4, he's encouraging them to allow their beliefs in Christ to also impact how, how they behave at home, how things function at home between husbands and wives, between parents and children, and even in the workplace, between he calls slaves and masters. Like we can apply that to the workplace. To allow your relationship with Christ to impact all of those different areas, the major themes of the letter. Good. See, so it's, it's you know, when sometimes you'll sit in a, in a sermon or you hear a, a, a Bible study, and the teacher or the pastor will, will pull out, you know, some, some 
nugget of wisdom and you'll say, man, how did he see that in that passage? Well, this is how he saw that. He's looking for the different passages and asking the question, why? Just you know, kind of like that annoying little kid on the playground. Why, 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 why? Keep asking that question. Why did he say that? Why would he answer that way? Why, why would he include this in the letter? Okay, the last thing I want to do as far as an exercise with this text um, is I want us to I want to do a quick exercise. Think about paragraphs. Um, you know, sometimes you'll sit in a sermon and the pastor, I, you know, I do it all the time. I won't, I won't preach the entire book, right? We, didn't, we don't have time for that on Sunday morning. How does he know the, the pastor or the teacher or that person who's, who's bringing the lesson? How do they know to focus on those verses? Just those. And you remember when we, one of the principles of studying the letters is we're looking for paragraphs. Just, you know, you, just the simple same paragraph breaks you would put in a letter if you wrote them and that's important because it helps us keep things in chunks so we kind of okay this is one thought let me see what i call it the big idea what's the main thought the main focus area of this one particular line of thought so looking at chapter one and just kind of scan over we're not going to read the whole thing but scan over it where do you think the first paragraph break is in chapter one Well, I mean, I feel like I'm cheating because uh, I'm using the app, oh. and it has like the headings. So I'm being, <laughs> I'm being honest. So we got, according to the app, it's at verse three, and then fifteen. All right, don't give us all of them. Twenty-four. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> don't do it. But yeah, the first paragraph break. And if you're not using the app, if you're using, I'm using my old school Bible. So if you're not using the app. Um, you can see that there, verses one and two are kind of one thought. This is an introductory kind of a you know a, an introductory paragraph. Identifies himself, identifies his audience, and then verse three begins a new thought. Right, it's kind of a reason I'm writing to you now. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying for you always, and he continues down through. Verse 12, he just continues a sort of one thought, actually through verse 8 rather, he continues that thought of, this is why I'm writing to you. And then verse 9, right, if you can see that, verse 9 looks like it begins a new thought. For this reason also, you know, and that's kind of where, you know, we see that as a new paragraph. Do you all see that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So as you, as you break up the text, so this, uh, so that's how you you know you kind of look at it and say where does one thought end and or one, one thought begin and where does it end? So when you're going to to prepare a lesson, bring a lesson, or or Reuben, one day when we get you up in the pulpit and you preach a sermon, you kind of this is how I focus. I can't take the entire chapter. There's just simply too much. We'll, we'll be here for hours if I try to take the whole chapter. Um, and it's and there's so much material, so many different thoughts covered here. If I try to take, you know, break apart the entire chapter, or even for my study, boy, I'm going to be all over the road. I, I've got to focus on each individual thought, and I kind of look for the paragraph breaks and say, where are the natural breaks in the thought? So then I see where the next paragraph begins. Sometimes, you know, I mentioned the the chapter numbers. And the verse numbers are not part of the original text. And most of the time, the translators do a pretty good job of not letting things spill over. But they don't always do a perfect job of that. Flip over to chapter 3 again. And if you look at the end of chapter 3, you're starting in verse 18 of chapter 3. He begins this discussion there of how our relationship with Christ 
impacts our home and impacts our work relationships. And so he starts in verse 18 talking about wives, this is how it impacts you. Verse 19, husbands, this is how it impacts you. Verse 20, children. Verse 21, fathers. And then he goes on in verses 23 through 25, just talking about the, the, your work relationships. And then chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, grant your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. So, at, and my point is just this as you're looking at, you're looking for paragraph breaks, forget as best you can the, the chapter breaks that are in the text, because sometimes they'll get in your way. This paragraph clearly runs from chapter 3, verse 18 through chapter 4, verse 1. And it's a little bit hinky. It's a little bit weird because you want it to be a clean break at the end of chapter three, but it's not. That thought continues into chapter four. So, so sometimes just forget those as best you can because sometimes they get in the way. Um, once in a while, um, you know, the, the sentences don't always line up clean with the verse numbers. And again, you try to forget those numbers are there because they try to do the best they could to you know, keep everything neat and clean like that, but sometimes it doesn't happen that way. So good, I, I, you guys did a great job looking at that text, pulling out the major themes, thinking about the paragraphs, and as we look at the letters, particularly the letters, but that applies with every genre you're looking at. You're looking for paragraph breaks, so to speak, because you're looking for thoughts. What's one major thought here? Let me deal with that. And then what is he saying about this thought before I move on to the next one? Okay, so questions about any of that? I want to spend our last few minutes talking about what we're doing next. Y'all have any questions, thoughts, insights, comments? No questions over here. Good stuff. Stoiber, is y'all good? We're all good over here. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about what we're going to do next. Um, tonight's the end of our um, introductory lessons, kind of getting a good foundation of what the Bible is and how we study it. And now I want to talk, I want to stop talking about how to study it and start actually studying it next week. Um, so, but I want your input. I want your your thoughts and your feedback, um, and um, your ideas on where we go next. Um, we talked a little bit about it last week. We we've got some options before. I think some things we could do. Um, we could do a question based series. You guys ask questions or throw it out there, and folks post questions on Facebook or whatever, um, and then we would take a question every week. And you know maybe we talk about some social issues and political issues with the election coming up uh, just in a few months, or deal with somebody might ask about evolution or end times issues or stuff like that. So we could do a got questions kind of what are your what are your your uh, burning questions out there? We could do a topical study similar to questions, but instead of having a different thought, you know, a different topic to study every week, and I got questions, a topical study, we would take one topic. What does the Bible say about joy, for example? Um, and we would spend weeks, several weeks, kind of just trying as best we can to exhaust where, what does the Bible have to say about this topic, and what are we, what are we to do with it, so we could do a topical study. Um, or we can jump into a book of the Bible, and just, you know, dig right in and, and start working our way through a book, verse by verse, phrase by phrase, and start working our way through. Um, of those three, what do y'all think? So my thought is either the got questions or the topical, because okay. I've got a question. <laughs> okay. Michael and Natasha, you got any thoughts on what you would like to see us do next?
Okay, we'll chew on it a little bit. Um, I'm also going to put it out there for, for those of you who are joining us via YouTube. Um, I want you to shoot me an email or post to the Facebook post, uh, reply to the Facebook post where you, you saw the video, the link for the video. Um, shoot me a WhatsApp or something and let me know what your thoughts are. Um, if we were to do a book of the Bible, um, I know we talked, Amanda, uh, last week, I think you mentioned the Revelation, and I think that's a great idea. Um, it's a meaty study, but it's, it's, it's a great idea to dig in a lot of interest. You know, it's a lot of stuff in there, and there's always a lot of questions that come up out of the Revelation. Um, I also thought maybe we, we might could do a study in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. Um, and really, that that book is about how to how to avoid spiritual drift. That's really what was happening in the church there. They were kind of drifting a little bit in their faith, and so we can we could do a study like that, or studying the book of James, a very practical Christian living, um, taking it to the streets, kind of faith on the streets sort of thing. As we read the book of James, um, so we've got some some thoughts, and I. You know, you may not have a specific um, preference tonight or a specific thought tonight about what uh, you want to do starting next week, but I want you to think about it and shoot me your, shoot me a note and give me your feedback, and then I'll I'll make a decision sometime before next Tuesday, and um, and then we'll jump into the study next Tuesday. And and if it is, you know, I, I I've done a couple of got questions sermon series in the past, um, and that always generates a lot of interest um because everybody has questions you know and, and, and once they start boy they just start to flow and, and they start to fly in so natasha i saw your note pop up um another another recommendation for the book of the revelation um so we'll um, i'll put this out to the youtube audience as well and we'll see uh, what we come back with. I may even put a, a poll up on Facebook um, so we can get a good idea. There may be some folks that haven't joined us yet uh, for this study, but once they kind of see what we're gonna be doing next, they may jump into the next one. So I'll put this out as a Facebook poll, I think. Um, and so then we can capture. So you guys take those same answers you just gave and plop them into the Facebook poll when I pop it up uh, later tonight or early tomorrow. Um, and then we'll let that go for a couple of days and then I'll make a decision on what we're doing next. Well, we're glad you guys joined us tonight. I'm glad we have an opportunity uh, to open up the Word and spend some time together. It's amazing that God has given us the technology to be able to do that um, and stay at home and not have to go out one more night and um, break social distancing and all that stuff. So I'm glad you guys joined us tonight. I'm glad we had an opportunity to, to kind of dig into those, um, those preliminary kind of lessons. And again, if you have questions, you guys joining here on Zoom or you guys on Facebook, you have questions that, or YouTube rather, you got you have questions you didn't get to ask tonight or you didn't think about until later, um, post them there on the Facebook page or shoot them to me and I'll post them there on the Facebook page so that I can answer them and then everybody benefits from both the question and the answer. Um, yeah, so I'm glad we had some time together tonight. So let me close our time in prayer and uh, let us get back to our evenings. And so pray with me. Father, thank you uh, once again for just the opportunity for us to get together, uh, to open up your word and to spend some time uh, studying it, looking at taking some of these principles that we've learned uh, and applying them to some scripture. Father, thank you for just the ability for us to be, to be better equipped and, and, and have better skills about how we approach the word of God. And so, Father, thank you for this time. And Lord, we pray for your blessings going forward, uh, what we're going to study, uh, where you'll have us uh, dig into your word and what you're going to teach us. We're so excited to see what you're going to teach us. And so would you bless those lessons ahead. Bless everyone who joined the study tonight. And Lord, we just pray for your hand on the rest of tonight and the rest of this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, now before you sign off, I, I, I need to ask about the night of the week. Because I said I was going to do that and I goofed up. When Kate and I talked about the ladies Bible study starting, I completely spaced that this was a Tuesday night, we did this. So she's got the lady study starting in September on Tuesday nights. Um, and she said she could move it to later, but I would hate to see 
some of some of you ladies that are in this that also have to do another study right after it or have to or feel like you have to choose. I want to do this one, but I, they're happening at the same time or happening the same night. Um, any any thoughts about what if we move this to Monday night? Would that be okay, or is there a better night that you would want to see this on rather than a Monday? Monday is fine. Okay. Michael, Natasha, you guys good on good for Monday or? Mondays are fine for us. Okay. We will continue on, on Tuesday nights for now. And again, I'll ask this question of the YouTube audience as well. You guys tell me what you think if Monday is good for you as well. Um, and I suppose send me a note if you don't, if you, if it doesn't work for you, and then we'll just go with sort of a silence is consent kind of thing. Um, but for now, we'll continue Tuesdays through the end of August. And then as we move into September, then we'll move to Monday nights. Okay, so that we kind of can stay on Tuesday nights for now. And then we'll adjust so that we don't have the conflict when the ladies study starts um, that first week in September. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys for, for uh, jumping in tonight. I pray you have a great week and uh, we will see you on Sunday. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night.